that was like getting into coaching at that level was uh, a little bit of it was I guess the not it wasn't my undergrad was in no way preparing me for to be a coach especially mm -hmm. at like a collegiate mm -hmm. level but it just kind of happened the way I, the timing worked out and I was able to get people um, get people interested excited about triathlon and I felt like I was pretty knowledgeable and so I really studied a lot of the sport and mm -hmm. I studied a lot mm -hmm. listened to a lot of podcasts listened, read a lot um, listened to some of the great coaches so I felt like I had a good knowledge and that I'd already obviously been there um, at a pretty high level. So I knew kind of what it took to get to that. And so that's why I think I kind of appealed to a lot of the, the athletes there. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre, skincare for athletes. Whether you're in the gym, on the mats, on the road, or in the pool, we protect your skin so you're more comfortable in your own body. To learn more, go to soulpre.com. Today on the Smart Athlete Podcast, my guest is the current 25-29 Sprint Draft Legal Age Group National Champion. Let's see if you can get that off back on the replay. Yeah. He is a former pro triathlete, currently a USAT certified coach, and he's the head coach for the triathlon club at San Diego State University. Welcome to the show, Zach Kamner. How's it going, Jesse? Going pretty well. I, you, you probably got a lot better um, weather going on in San Diego right now than we have. We've had like rain ruining 4th of July. Oh, man. We were, <laughs> it's actually really, it's gorgeous today and it was nice yesterday. But, but the past like two weeks, we've had some just overcast skies bunch of like kind of light rain here and there and it's been, it hasn't really hit the summer yeah but now today it's nice and sunny and gorgeous see i don't, I don't believe you i just I, I in my head san diego is just nice all the time there's never bad day. and <laughs> we've had a really wet nice. winter it's crazy <laughs> normally we don't normally we have the nice sunny but yeah this this whole winter and spring has just been ugh, not great so how does um with you know cl club racing like Around here, we've got a couple of the colleges that have clubs, and they'll race what I refer to as the normal season, basically summertime. Do mm -hmm. you guys have like in school, like an in school tri season, or is it also just the summer? No, so we actually the West Coast Collegiate Conference. They we have a season. It's more so in lines with like a traditional kind of track track and field season where we start. Okay. We have a couple kind of small races in the fall that count towards our ranking, but by and large, the bulk of the season that we have for collegiate club in, especially in California, um, but it's probably like this all the West Coast too, is in uh, basically January through April for nationals. Okay. So it all kind of like takes place in that, that first four months of the year. So they jam pack probably six or seven races within that, within so about two and a half. You can get away with it because you have all that beautiful weather. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> San Diego. yeah most of the time yeah although even like in january you'll get we get a, we have a couple pool races so mm -hmm. those are always fine but you'll get like a cage in the downpour that'll make that'll have to cancel the swim um but by and large it's it's all said and done yeah it's like i'm in the middle of the country so tri season doesn't start till may here i have to travel if i want to go somewhere else and even in may there's been like water's too cold we've got a this year they shortened to 1500 down to 600 meters for the race Gosh. in May, because they're like, "Oh, water's too cold," and I'm like, "Oh, it's, 50, it's 58. Yeah. It's fine, but <laughs> you kind of got to be safe, I guess." Yeah, yeah, but you definitely have to at some point. It, usually, we've had a couple of that that occasion that happened several times this year, in particular. It's not normally like that where we've had, like I said, we've had a really wet winter, and so a lot of times in San Diego, the water quality gets really, really bad with runoff. So we had to cancel a couple swims. Um, so just fingers crossed. Or is it summer. like yeah. like any kind no, of it's just growth or? the water quality? Water okay. quality. Uh, the okay. temperatures. I mean, it's cold, but it's rarely under fifty nine to sixty. Yeah. At that time of the year, so it's not too bad. So do your I'll call them kids, but they're not you know that much younger. Do your kids no, also like continue to race? <laughs> do they what race in the summer? Do they continue to race in the summer as well? Yes. Yeah, a lot of them will. Um, a couple, most of them, state is in is different because we actually have a lot of out of town kids, surprisingly, okay. um, that come in and race, and they're all like usually in parts of California. 
uh-huh. but they go home and I encourage them to race pretty regularly during the summer, but we have a small group of maybe like six athletes here during the summer that they'll race the local events um, and just kind of keep their training up. We have a small like summer training group that we just kind of keep and it's pretty light. So it's nothing really serious, just yeah. really focusing on like getting consistent miles in during the summer. Okay. And so, I mean, I don't know, I guess I'll say, I don't know anything about club racing since I was, I was on scholarship to run in college. So I'm kind of familiar with the regulations there, but do you like, I know with NCAA, there's only so many hours, like a coach can have contact with athletes and like that kind of stuff. Are you regulated like that? Or is it almost just whatever, wherever no. you want to go? No. So we're actually not, I believe they're, they're starting to actually, there's talk of more regulation with that, um, with the advent of more NCAA schools uh, joining in triathlon. Mm-hmm. But I think by and large, especially during the summer, we're not regulated to that extent, especially mm-hmm. considering most of our athletes are not going to be training with the team on campus. So where we kind of have a little bit of free reign, not that many of my athletes are going to be training even close to 20 hours during the summer. Um, yeah. And I think it's pretty, it's, that's a pretty big course, pretty big load for athletes to maintain at the collegiate level, unless you're training kind of really, really training full time, like the NCAA girls that, that are, say like ASU that are probably training close to that 20 hour range. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I think I was training seven to nine hours maybe a week in college and and maintaining classes like i don't know if i could imagine trying to do 18 credit hours a semester and also training 20 hours a week just yeah bananas it yeah it's really having now even now like working as working a regular job on top of coaching um seeing the balance that the athletes have to have uh with the training and their schooling all kind of combined and triathlon is not like running. I know a lot of runners and swimmers, mm-hmm. and it was basically you, know, you had that designated time in the morning or maybe in the afternoon where you, you have that one practice. And maybe you run on your own, mm-hmm. you know, in the morning if you're a double or whatever. But triathlon, it's you know, getting a swim, a bike, a run in every day, for example, is is a huge time commitment, especially for for athletes that are just getting started in the sport. Because it's not, you know, you're not like getting a former and so a former high school triathlete usually usually right. athletes that all are going to be maybe they're former runners former swimmers maybe they're and a lot of times they're people that have no experience in any of those sports and so they'll be really having to balance now all of a sudden not only training for one sport we're training for two more on top of a course load as a freshman mm-hmm. far from home it's a big it's a big uh, shift so a lot of the freshmen really kind of have to embrace that team aspect a lot with making sure that you're not pushing them too hard because the overall stress load is really high for those athletes. Yeah, big adjustments all around. I, you know, I, I think that not just doing three sports, but it's almost like the mental shift between, all right, I got to warm up, get this workout in, cool down, somehow recover mentally for the next workout, and then do stuff in between. It, it, to me, it's almost more tactical taxing on the mind sometimes than it is on the body like the body can keep up but just mentally you're like i'm tired of pushing i just need to sit down for a minute yeah definitely so it's important i i really try to going back to like the summer we really try to like keep it the athletes that do stay and i give training in the past i've kind of given like really structured training to kind of Mm -hmm. really get big fitness gains during the summer but I found that a lot of athletes, they might get really into that for about three or four weeks and they start to really peter off with their just consistency just because they're, they're so tired from already a full season mm-hmm. of training racing. And we're racing maybe probably every other week a lot of yeah. the season in the spring. So sprint distance or what, 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 distance, are they, what distance are they racing? Mostly sprint distance. We okay. race Olympic distance at our regional championship and the nationals. Obviously. Okay. Okay. So we're gearing towards the, the Olympic distance, but it's mostly sprint events, which are not incredibly taxing. But when you're doing a lot, basically one every other week, or sometimes yeah. every week we've had during the season, it can be pretty tiring, especially with travel. Um, and it's not we're tra- flying across the country, which is good, but it's having to sit in a car for four hours to go up to Santa Barbara or to Irvine or wherever we're going really kind of can take its toll. <laughs> and then having 
the comeback to every almost every athlete has to on Sunday afternoon drive back from race and then go and sit at four o'clock in the afternoon. And now they have to study for their test they have tomorrow mm. after spending the whole weekend traveling and racing. It's so yeah, it's a big load. So I try to keep things really really light in the summer um, with just kind of getting some skills. And developed as well as just like general consistency in training. And there's so, no, I mean, there's no scholarship involved with no. the club kids, right? So that's like it's it's not only is it there's no there's no like financial incentive for okay, I've got to keep it up. Yeah. It's just it's in, entirely like self-imposed masochism to be like, all right, I'm gonna do all of this. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. It's really I've talked because I I work closely with. Um, a good friend of mine who is the associate head coach for the women's swim team at state mm -hmm. and uh, they train full on through the summer you know they're, they're getting up at 6 a.m every day pretty much during the summer to go train and swim in the pool um but obviously they're incentivized to, to keep that scholarship and to perform well whereas everybody on my team will go home and kind of a few weeks rest and then they come back in the fall, hopefully they have a good base of fitness and they develop some skills. Mm -hmm. But there's really, it's really very self motivated. It has to be like within them. Yeah, yeah. So I'll shift gears a little bit. So you're a, a former pro. Like we we're talking about before, we kind of got going. You, you're only 26, correct? Yeah. So I mean, it seems like pretty early to step down as a as a pro, considering you know typically endurance peak is 35 plus or minus five years so so what was i mean what's the decision to to turn in the pro card and, and give it up i mean uh i mean it was more so a lot of it was a financial thing i kind mm -hmm. of so i turned pro um at 21 i just turned 21 okay and uh, i had been gunning for it through college uh racing pretty regularly um i went to school in colorado and so obviously I lived in Boulder, so I have the, the tri scene is really big there. Right. And so I really was trying to push for getting that pro card. I'd only been in the sport for maybe two and a half years. But a big part of that was just being in that atmosphere of high performance mm -hmm. and just being around. It's like, man, I, I, I needed to, I should do this while I'm, while I can, because mm -hmm. I might not get this other opportunity. Um, and so got that, got the pro card at 21, uh, started racing. My plan was initially to go to um, the following year and race a lot of the back in this is 2014 or 2015, something like that. They had the non draft um, lifetime fitness series. Yeah. They're the non draft Olympic series. That was my goal was to race, or start racing that and maybe try and do some IT races on the side mm -hmm. just because I do enjoy the draft legal racing. But by and large, that was going to be my bread and butter was the non draft Olympic. For now, and then maybe progress to half Ironman or later on. Mm -hmm. and, and within the first five months of me being pro, they cut that whole series, all the prize money, and that whole opportunity. Kind of, there's a really great article out there somewhere. I can't remember who wrote it um, about like how that that was a huge blow to pro triathletes. Yeah, and developing athletes was when they cut that series because it kind of destroyed that pathway for young pros to move from the Olympic non-draft to the 70.3 and Ironman over the course of, you know, six or seven years. Yeah, because um, they're, they're two completely different disciplines, draft legal versus non-draft, and then especially when you absolutely. go long distance, yeah. Yeah, so you kind of cut out that middle ground. Um, and I had planned my whole season out to where, like, I'm going to race, you know, probably five times, five times in these events and maybe do, you know, some of the local Claremont or the local ITU events like in Claremont, Sarasota. Mm -hmm. Um but then that got scrubbed. And so I kind of was like, well, you know, I'm not really, I was, I wouldn't ever consider myself super talented. I just work really hard. Okay. So by and large, I was decent across all three sports to, to become a pro, but to really kind of make that next step, I really need to focus a lot more. And after college, I came back home and was had some big student loans to pay. So I kind of had to kind of, swallow my pride a little bit take out and start working some normal jobs and try and see where that went so i tried for about a year and a half to balance like a good job with racing pro but at the high level for 70.3 you have to be 100 percent committed is what i found you can't 
be half in and half out. You have yeah, to. Yeah, really I mean, ball. unless you're unless you're like a a genetic freak, then you could do it. But if, if you're a genetic freak and you're doing well, you you could probably be all in anyway. So yeah, yeah, I didn't. I I, I guess I couldn't justify in my head the the biggest thing is I couldn't justify financially continuing down that path, at least right now. Maybe in yeah. the future, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, I couldn't justify going down, continuing to go into the hole financially for uh, something that. I wasn't probably going to make it incredibly far in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I decided to put that, put that aside. And I had already been coaching a lot. And I found that I actually really enjoyed coaching a lot more than I did racing at that high level. I enjoyed racing. and I love racing. But racing on the pro side is a whole different ball game. And I mm -hmm. found that just training consistently up to you know, 20, 25 hours a week was really, it's what you have to do to be good. And I found that over time, I just, I didn't, I love the racing, but I didn't quite love that high volume training all the time year round. Mm -hmm. It just takes it out of you and then trying to work on top of that. So it just became the decision to just kind of focus a little more on coaching and try and get like a real normal nine to five job that mm -hmm. I could do on top of that. So that's kind of how the pro career ended. Um, but I wouldn't, I guess that it wasn't much of a career. I didn't make a whole, any money off of it. <laughs> Well, that's okay. I, 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 like, I, I mean, we've had this conversation. So I talk, I've talked to a couple of different pros. Um, I, do you know Mike Meehan? I'm sorry? Do you Mike know Mike Meehan? Oh, it's, yeah, the collegiate. He's races collegiate now again. I've definitely see, seen his name at the like, Nationals. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think he's still racing professionally, but maybe he had stepped down. Um, anyway, he, we kind of talked about like how various pros – make it financially and just how really there's only like the top 10 percent or whatever that make a living from racing yeah. so it's always like you know and you kind of illustrated the the reality of it that it's like you need an income source outside of racing if you want to race absolutely. but then that hampers your ability to race yeah absolutely it's it's the catch-22 and yeah. so i just kind of I, I didn't see, and I also I found my heart wasn't in 70.3 racing, yeah. um, which was just super long. You have to kind of really have a passion for that end of, it's a, I mean, it's almost like a completely different sport than the shorter mm -hmm. course, the short course racing, especially yeah, I, draft. I agree. So it wasn't quite what I liked doing uh, a lot. So I remember my, my first, first few pro races, um, they were enjoyable because you have your, your racing against my first half iron man was uh in 2016 2017 when um yan ferdino came to oceanside mm -hmm. so getting to be like getting to have that experience was great and it was a blast to actually get to race with guys like that and guys that are actually doing it at that level mm -hmm. um but you know three and a half hours into a race and you're suffering on the run and i kind of was like man this is i'm not really enjoying this a whole lot like <laughs> <laughs> Two or two hours ago, it was fun the, for the first two hours, but I just did, wasn't quite enjoying it like I used to at, mm -hmm. at that long distance. So I decided just to kind of step down and focus more on the coaching. And then now with the advent of more age group draft legal racing, I'm able to kind of continue doing that. Thankfully, my the age group swim and run is not nearly as fast as the actual pros, yeah. so I can actually be pretty not yet. Yeah, yeah, not yet. But yeah, but it's, it's good. It's training in that direction. But yeah. I can actually be somewhat competitive still in that stuff, which I enjoy. Yeah. What, what did you do your undergrad in? So I actually got my undergrad in uh, aviation technology. Okay. So I studied aviation. Yeah. It's, my background's kind of... That's what I thought. I, mean, I, I thought I saw something yeah. about aviation, but I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure. So th th there was not a master plan for you to become a coach from undergrad. No. Or? Not at all. No, I was, um, I had kind of just by nature of, I think being kind of fast and, um, the triathlon community in where I live now in Chula Vista is, was at the time kind of really starting to blow up. Mm -hmm. And so there weren't a lot of really coaches, San Diego is known for triathlon, but when people think of San Diego, they think of the nice, the beachy side, the very on the coast, especially on triathlete for the triathletes, the North County, um, triathlon scene but the south bay where i live further south of i-8 is uh, was very underdeveloped and it was just starting to uh to boom back in like the 2010 2011 
And so there weren't a lot of coaches. And so people just kind of by nature, just when you're fast, people want to know how you got fast. And so they just kind of ask you for <laughs> okay. advice. And I took, I kind of coached a couple people before I, while I was in college. And it wasn't till I spent, I came back for a year uh, to do some coursework at San Diego State that I got hooked up with the triathlon team mm -hmm. there. And uh, just kind of through circumstance and timing, just fell into kind of volunteering coaching for the team there. Zach, I may have lost you. And then that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're right. I just, you were talking and then you were gone. <laughs> you're good now. The, okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, but that was like getting into coaching at that level was uh, a little bit of, it was, I guess the not, it wasn't, my undergrad was in no way preparing me for, to be a coach, especially mm -hmm. at like a collegiate mm -hmm. level. But it just kind of happened the way I, the timing worked out, and I was able to get people um, get people interested, excited about triathlon. And I felt like I was pretty knowledgeable, and so I really studied a lot of the sport. And mm -hmm. I studied a lot, listened to a lot of podcasts, listened, read a lot, um, listened to some of the great coaches. So I felt like I had a good knowledge, and then I'd already obviously been there um, at a pretty high level. So I knew kind of what it took to get to that. And so that's why I think I kind of appealed to a lot of the, the athletes there.